And I know that uh, there's a lot of things we did yesterday, but I think a lot of us really feel like the kickoff of this conference is always Marshall's welcoming address. So Marshall Saunders, could you please join me up here? in 1988, and uh, I love Mark right away. So we are so lucky, I'm so lucky to have Mark. Um, so the first thing here on my list is hello and, and welcome. And uh, I thank God that you are here, every, every one of you. I'm so deeply appreciative that you're here. I'm talking about the person in your chair. Thank you for being here. You are a dream come true. <laughs> you are a dream come true. Well, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about uh, my early days of becoming a citizen's lobbyist. Not a citizen's climate lobbyist, but I started out in hunger and poverty with my Dear friend, Sam Daly Harris. Is Sam around? <laughs> Sam? Yeah, he's Sam. Sam. Sam started uh, results in a phone booth at the middle school in Miami. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I uh, deeply admire uh, Sam. Well, um, I'm going to... Um, uh, I, I began uh, as a citizen lobbyist at Results, and we lobbied for hunger and poverty issues. Um, that was about 21 years ago. And so I'm going to tell you two little stories that occurred about then, my beginnings of citizen uh, lobbying. Just a couple of words about citizens' climate lobby, my very earliest thoughts about it. And then who we are, I'm going to be so bold as to say who you and I are. And then uh, a quote, and I'll close with a quote. So um, back in 19, can everybody hear me well? Is it, is it clear? Am I speaking loud enough and everything? OK, good. Uh, back in about 1994, uh, I was just a new a results partner, and the group leader called and said we had a meeting with uh, the member of Congress. And so we walked into the member's office. There were six or seven uh, results uh, partners there. And uh, they ushered us into the meeting room. And there were these very impressive, luxurious chairs. This is my first time ever meeting with a member of Congress. I'd seen one in the parade one time. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we sat down on these very uh, luxurious chairs and promptly in comes the member of Congress, first one I had ever, ever met. We all said hello and uh, sat down. He was dressed in a dark blue suit and a conservative tie. And I, I, uh, and I was seated straight across from him. There was no table in between to protect me. <laughs> and I looked, I could see his shoes, and then uh, his shoes, I could count the overhead lights and, and the reflection in his sh <laughs> shoes. And so I was, I was nervous. I was nervous. Um, as the meeting began, uh, and the results partners began to talk, uh, the only thing I could think about were uh, my legs. <laughs> Where should they be? <laughs> they were, uh, I noticed that, that my legs were crossed at the ankles, and I thought, now that kind of looks goofy. I should. <laughs> and then, and I crossed them at the knees, and I thought, no, that looks laid back. 
I can't do that, so I'm squirming around, and I don't know if he's looking at me or not. Meanwhile, the meeting is going on. <laughs> I have no idea what's being said. Then there was a problem with my hands and arms. And I didn't know what to do with them. And I had them folded in my lap, and I thought, no, that's schoolboy. I shouldn't do that. So I put on, and I put them on, yeah, right, on the arms of the chair. Uh, and the results partners were talking about different things, but I, again, I didn't know what they were talking about. I wasn't listening. And then I did notice that the lady next to me, I think it was Anne Marie Vorbach, it was, she was beginning her talk, and uh, I thought, well, I've got just enough time to run my talk through my head one more time. One more time. And that's when I discovered that I didn't remember <laughs> what my talk was about. <laughs> really, I mean, I was stunned. It was a blank. And I said, Lord, Lord, if you'll just give me the first two words, I'll, I'll, take, it, I'll take it from there. <laughs> But uh, the Lord uh, did not respond. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> so then it was my turn. Um, now the room turned and looked at me, and uh, I didn't know what to say. The group leader, Bruce Underhill, uh, said, Marshall is going to talk about the microcredit bill in the house. I thought, oh yeah, the microcredit bill, right. <laughs> well, just a, a word for a group leader. Thank you very much. I, I'll never forget. So um, I, you know, I practiced this thing too much, probably. So uh, I, uh, I started talking, and it really, really came out good. You know, like I was, I was practiced up once I, but, but. Um, so let me see, uh, 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 Mr. Bill Bray, I asked him at the end of my talk if he would co-sponsor a microcredit bill that was in the ho house at the time. And uh, he said, call back in a couple of days. And so I did, and he was going to sponsor the bill, co-sponsor the bill. And uh, it was about $250 million, about $250 million. And a consequence of that, he co-sponsored that bill every year thereafter. We had to call him and tell him. That it was time to, to, to put his name on it, but he did it every year he was in office. And then uh, I was, I had so much luck, I was asked to uh, uh, invite him to co-sponsor uh, two tuberculosis bills. One was uh, domestic, uh, and then one was a global. And uh, that was the beginning of the United States funding uh, uh, micro, uh, I mean, uh, tubercu tuberculosis. And, and that bill, that essentially that bill, that uh, uh, later encompassed uh, uh, AIDS, tuberculosis, and uh, malaria. And that thing, last time I took a look, it was over a, a billion dollars. And of course, it wasn't just Mr. Bill Bray, it was my results partners all over the country having success and all working together in an organized, uh, coordinated, way. Um, here's a, a, again, back in 1995, I think this was uh, my first effort at getting uh, something published in the San Diego Union Tribune. For years, uh, the San Diego Union Tribune had not published anything uh, on results as issue. We might have gotten one a letter to the editor three years before. It was, it was just like that. And so the partners wanted to, to t get angry placards and walk back and forth in front of headquarters. And I said, no, let's, let's not do that. Let me see what I can do for uh, a little while. And so uh, I looked at the editorial page, which I had never done before. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw at the top was a guy by the name of Bob Kittle, uh, the, uh, top uh, editorial editor for, the, for that section of the paper, and I called him. Uh, 
and uh, he didn't answer the phone. I left him a nice message, and uh, two days later, he still hadn't called me back. <laughs> uh, what's this? You know, it's like, I, and so uh, I sent him an email, and I, I, we had an editorial packet. It was still done by the same guy, Steve, and, um, and uh, he uh, didn't call me back, no email back. And a few months later, there was another issue, and I, I called him again. Middle, March of Thunder, blah, blah, blah. And uh, two days later, still no call back. Well, um, I'm embarrassed to say that this went on for about a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, maybe it was even two years. But, but there was this thing I thought about later. It's like, uh, I was doing my job. He wasn't doing his job as I saw it. And I didn't have to talk to anybody. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the group leader, again, God bless group, group leader, said, uh, why don't you try calling somebody else? <laughs> And uh, being a well-trained volunteer, I thought, that's a good idea. <laughs> I'll call somebody else. So uh, uh, I, I looked at the editorial section in the San Diego Union Tribune, uh, and the top guy was not Mr. Kittle, but rather it was a guy named uh, uh, Robert Caldwell. I called him up, and he answered the phone the first guy I've ever spoken to at the San Diego Union Tribune. And uh, I started talking. And I got just a little bit into my uh, laser talk. And, uh, and he said, I was expecting an important call. <laughs> and you're not it. <laughs> Uh, well, I swallowed, and I just kept talking. <laughs> First guy I ever spoke to down there. So in a minute, he said, stop reading to me. I said, Mr. Caldwell, I'm not reading to you. I'm just talking. And uh, he kept me on the phone for uh, an hour, almost an hour, just short of an hour. And... Uh, this is the piece that uh, he published in the Sunday section. This is the piece he published. Uh, front and back of the editorial section of the paper. <clears throat> so let me see where I am. Um, my results partners in other parts of the country were having success too. And that year, again, or that year we got 250 million, maybe we got that microcredit bill up to 300 million a year. And uh, by the way, the San Diego Union Tribune I delivered this Sam wrote half of it, and I wrote the other half. And the San Diego Union Tribune delivered that to 544,000 homes and businesses. And through all this, I was brand new at it. I was astonished at the power I had working with partners across the country and getting uh, uh, timely information from the staff. And uh, in the related, you know, this guy at the Indianapolis results partner calling on the Indianapolis Star, he was having great success. And, uh, and that was an encouragement to me. And also the power of not giving up and not giving up because the group leader was with me and the national calls were with me. Uh, and I could hardly believe all this was happening. I was astonished at the power that uh, 
real estate broker, a real estate broker hat. So now we're getting near the end of my talk, and I want to tell you, I guess there's just, I want to tell you just a little bit about my earliest thoughts at, of CCL, uh, a little bit about who you and I are, and then I'm going to close with a quote and uh, I'll be done. So in the very beginning, when the idea of using the results uh, methodology to preserve the climate first occurred to me, I knew, you know, so one of those things, you know, you know it's the right thing to do. And uh, it simply uh, had to be done. And uh, there was a question about whether or not I had the guts to stick out that far, risk myself that far. But I believe uh, it was put up or shut up. My wife helps me with that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I believe this is the most important work that humankind has ever been offered. And we are really honored by the opportunity to do this work. I used to think that the important people were taking care of the important problems. I don't think that anymore. Uh, and so it's up to us little people, it's up to us little people to preserve this climate and to preserve this civilization and this world. Now, there, um, I, I occasionally read an author's name is Ron Smotherman. He's a fellow Texan. And uh, I'm going to just tell you a couple of things that he said that are very important to me. And I have kind of learned this as I have gone along the way. Who we are, who you and I are, is truly magnificent. So magnificent that it puts all that other stuff that we are normally proud of totally in the shade. Who we really are is someone who liter literally aches to make a contribution to life. Someone who really wants it to matter that they have lived. What you and I do and do not do counts. What you and I do not do has a profound effect upon the world. And life asks for our full expression. And what underlies our willingness to risk ourselves to be fully expressed is love. L-O-V-E. And so, uh, yeah, we're to love each other, love ourselves, love each other, love those who would oppose us, and really love for all of life. <laughs> so um, here's a quote, and I'll be, uh, I'll be done. This is from uh, George Bernard Shaw, Man and Superman, Act Three. This is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose, recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish, little clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. <laughs> I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community. And as long as I live, it is my privilege 
to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die, for the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It is a, so, it is a sort of splendid torch, which I have got a hold of for the moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations.